Just a quick overview of CLP uh, India. I actually, I think it said uh, Hong Kong. CLP is a Hong Kong-based company. We have subsidiaries in India, Australia, People's Republic of China, as well as uh, Taiwan, and we have some investments, some small investments left in, uh, in Thailand. So CLP India is a wholly owned subsidiary of the CLP group and is one of the largest foreign investors in the Indian power sector. We have a total committed investment of over 2.2 billion US dollars and total committed capacity in excess of 2,900 megawatts. This investment is spread across a diversified and environmentally friendly generation portfolio that includes gas combined cycle, supercritical coal that has FGD capability, probably the first one in India, it is not required there, and gas combined cycle and wind, wind energy. We have close to 1,000 megawatts of wind. About 700 plus is operating and the other 300 is under construction or committed. So we've been operating the 655 megawatt combined cycle plant in uh, Gujarat state since 2002. That actually got CLP India started in India. It's a very well run plant. It looks like a, a nature park. And we've been awarded uh, the NOSCAR status under NOSA for the last three years in a row. So it's a pretty good recognition of the excellence in overall management and operations of that facility. I mentioned that we just built a 2 by 660 megawatt supercritical uh, coal-fired plant in the state of Haryana. We just put that into commercial operation uh, the first half of last year. Technically, the plant is in very good shape, very good condition. Unfortunately, we do not have a lot of coal. So the operating uh, regime of that plant has basically been uh, one unit at technical minimum and peaking at the peak hours at night. And I mentioned uh, we're also one of the largest wind power developers. This uh, nearly 1,000 megawatts of wind power is scattered across five different states in India. So the topic I was given was learning innovative leadership strategies. strategies. So I'm not going to focus on technical uh, issues because Management and leadership is more about people skills and being able to adapt to different situations. The topic is quite broad to be covered in a short time period uh, and with 15 slides. So what I've decided to do is to discuss a few uh, conceptual uh, uh, statements, if you will, or consultant buzzwords uh, that'll show, and then I'm gonna show two different applications of how some of these uh, uh, things are used within your management uh, style. But the absolute key concept I want to stress is that you need to be able to change your leadership style to suit the team and priorities that you're facing. So learn by doing, but always respect people. I've tried to apply this in every country I've worked uh, in, and, uh, and I've worked in quite a few, and I've been able to be successful in all of them. But it really is about earning trust and respect of your people. So some of the concepts uh, that you will all read, you can go to classes on this, but I'll tell you the best way to learn uh, leadership and management, innovative leadership and management, is just to walk around and learn by doing. You can learn some concepts in training classes, but the experience is the best way to deal with this. So some of the things uh, that, I, that I'll focus on are walking around, listening and observing, you must know the history of the business or the asset that you're focusing on. You must know the key players within a business, especially amongst the employees. You must have clear objectives without conflicting signals. You must get team consensus on priorities and the actions that you want to take. You must have a culture of innovation. In India, it's called Jugad. This is, this is a way that you can uh, make things work uh, almost like a MacGyver out of nothing. You must really uh, have an open mind for some of these things. You need to understand the risks and maintain flexibility in action. Never fear doing what is possible, which is leading, versus the easy route, which is managing. Now some of these are, are consultant buzzwords. Consultants would love to take a lot of your money and tell you things like collaboration workshop, search conference, sustainability seems to be a big buzzword nowadays. But the best thing to do is to keep it simple, but pay attention to detail and look for continuous improvement. It's all about people, not technology. So use technology tools wisely. 
and demonstrate a non-egotistical passion and true sincerity, or maybe you need to find a different career. If you want to just sit in an office in this business and manage by uh, dictate from your office, it's going to be very difficult for you. So what I tried to do is to work this into two examples. It's a little bit of storytelling, but if you'll bear with me going through these examples, I think some of the key terms that I mentioned, you will see how they work. So I want to set uh, the background for the first example. The corporate business development team just bought a small power company consisting of two power stations located on and near a very large copper mine that had been shut down due to what they called economic reasons. The original use of the power stations was for powering the mine operations in the housing village, and it was to be converted to an IPP. There were over 650 employees that transferred as part of the deal, but thousands of others in the area were now without work, and a communist-backed union had been shut out in this transition from power station to IPP. This is 650 employees was for a 40 megawatt diesel plant and a nearby 200 megawatt thermal plant consisting of a number of smaller coal-fired units. So you can see it was grossly overstaffed. The original expatriate manager has been on the job for nearly two years, but it had to be pulled out suddenly due to employee issues and six lost time accidents in the first year, including in, year, in, the, in the one year, including two that were fatal. So you've just arrived at your new assignment. Congratulations. Time to use some innovative leadership to solve the problem. So where do you start? Obviously, you have to get to know the team. You have to ask a lot of questions, ask about problems and concerns. This is the listen and observe portion. Then you need to walk around asking the same kind of questions to everyone you meet. This is assessment time for you to assess your new team and for them to assess you. Knowing the history of the business and understanding the culture that you're operating in are critical. So during this process, determine key players amongst the 650 employees and who the go-to employees are. After a reasonable period of time, reflect and develop the innovative leadership strategies to apply against what you have discovered in a priority manner. So what was discovered? That past managers and corporate visitors talked only, but had no action. Some employees commented that they, were li that they lied, and not one of them, they weren't part of, the, part of the team. They were viewed as outsiders. They were not one of them. Second thing that was noticed, bathrooms in the plant were promised. Now you say, what's this got to do with operating a power plant? I think those of you that have managed a power station knows what that means. There was a promise made that there would be no layoffs, but plans were already being prepared for reductions. A canteen for employees was promised and never delivered. Safety shoes and helmets were promised. That was an interesting one to hear because the company uh, regarded itself as very uh, high in safety. And yet, at this particular asset, this, this was a lie that was given to the employees. Security boundary wall at the thermal plant was promised and a warehouse for materials None of this was, uh, was done. Because of all of this, you also discovered that a union vote was already scheduled. You could not stop this. It was legally required to be held within a six-month period of time from the time that you arrived. So this is what you've discovered, and this is the situation you faced. So how to solve through innovative leadership. Let's take the first one. Past managers, corporate visitors talked only. There was no action, and they were viewed as not one of them, not one of the employees. So one of the things that you have to do is you have to dress the part. You have to walk around, listen, and observe, learn the history, basically to earn trust and respect. Determine the shadow leaders. I mentioned go-to people. In any organization, there are always people within the organization that certain employees will go to for advice. The employees trust these people. If you can find out who these people are, they will be very helpful for you when you try to implement your changes. One key change from previous managers, they never went to the plant. They always stayed in the office. So that was something that was heard. So by going out in the plant, walking around, 
you were able to change that impression that they had of the previous management and build a little trust and respect. They mentioned the bathrooms in the plant were promised. A committee was formed ensuring at least one of these shadow or go-to uh, employees was a member, trusting that they would become the nominated committee head. The mandate was to choose locations, ensuring that minimal budget was spent wisely. The full authority was given, and I just said I wanted to be briefed only and give the final okay. They went ahead, they built these bathrooms, and once they were built, I made sure I used them personally to ensure that cleanliness was maintained. Again, if they had just built these, who knows what would have happened to them. A promise was made that there would be no layoffs, but plans were already being prepared for a reduction. This one was quite tricky because a responsible business manager realizes 650 employees for basically 240 megawatts of power generation is uh, unsustainable. And there was going to be a, a, a union vote coming up because they were nervous about layoffs. So this hostile union history and an impoverished community from the copper mine layoffs did not uh, allow any kind of reduction in staff. So this time I formed another team, and this is called a task force, with the Human Resources Department leading the way. Other, other members of this team were heads of the major departments, with one, again, influential worker or go-to worker selected to match the number of management representatives. I only worked with them to identify opportunities and business synergies. Looking at the various work being subcontracted, we established small subsidiary companies that employees could volunteer for. We call these transfers. Trucking diesel oil to the diesel power plant, for example. There was a T&D company to support the local electric co-op. There was some gravel mining and trucking opportunities. We had very good engineers, so we had some civil design and construction work that could be done. This eliminated some of the contract work costs from the business by shifting them to our skilled labor force that we already had. This task force was never disbanded and continued to look for innovative ways to use the employee talents. Outage management and O&M support for the national utility even at one point we helped. So in a few cases, these subsidiaries later grew to the point where we were able to sell them, taking along the employees. So this was one innovation we did to try to control the number of staff. Canteen was promised. Got behind on my slide here. Okay, the canteen was promised. Same approach as the bathrooms. In this case, the committee ultimately built the canteen, myself and other employee volunteers helping on weekends. We set up a cooperative of all employees to run it, which also required small donations and a membership board. This provided a feeling of ownership, and we used this canteen to cater all company events for visitors, etc. <clears throat> Safety shoes and helmets were promised. This, all, this turned out to be linked to the lost time injuries and deaths. It was a mental link only and an attitude excuse, but real nonetheless. Our purchasing team was instructed to buy shoes and proper, sa proper safety helmets for all employees, using the budget money allocated for replacing my vehicle. I made sure everybody knew that it was more important for me to ensure their safety than it was for me to have a new vehicle. And that's a very long story, but uh, you can see me afterwards for that. All employees did have bump caps, but I had an employee party after the new hard hats arrived where we scraped the company logo off these bump caps and ensured people wore them when they rode their motorbikes. We ended up buying two pairs of shoes for everyone also. It's a long story, but basically these were some of the nicest shoes they ever had and they either went to people for weddings or they didn't want to scuff them up in the plant. So I bought them all a second pair so that they could wear them at work. Secondly, and most importantly, I held an all-employee meeting where I told everyone that existing safety procedures would be scrapped in total. I had a symbolic burning of the old copies to make the point. Safety had been pushed and created by many corporate visitors that did not understand the culture. Again, the company was very strong on safety. They had these established safety procedures, but they were way too complicated and nobody was reading them. And when they didn't follow through with safety hats and, uh, and uh, safety shoes, it became quick, clear that uh, nobody was being sincere about that. So immediately, we put a buddy system in place as our safety program for everyone moving around the thermal plant. And a new safety committee was formed to develop a new set of simple but understandable safety rules for all to follow. 
Ownership was the key. The first year results, zero lost time incidents, and the best performance ever and recognized by corporate headquarters out of a portfolio of 10,000 megawatts scattered around uh, the globe. So it was quite a testimony to what the employees were able to do once they were empowered. Okay, security boundary wall at the thermal plant was promised and a warehouse for materials. This is somewhat linked to safety as it was impossible to ensure security, so theft was rampant. And some materials were lost due to weather conditions when stored outdoors. We abandoned some CapEx money that was originally set aside to rehabilitate one of the oldest units at the thermal plant for both of these projects. I determined that even if rehabilitated, the capacity of the unit was so small that it would not be economic anyway. The previous manager, who was 100% technical, felt it was critical to rebuild everything that was purchased regardless. Our new employee construction subsidiary designed and built the boundary wall and the warehouse. This also helped to relocate what we called miners who were on the property tunneling for scrap metal left over from an abandoned foundry operation. They would tunnel and with our coal pile close by, bulldozers would often cause a collapse, posing an additional safety hazard. All excavated soil with metal scraps was spread outside the new boundary wall so that these people could continue to mine the scrap materials. With the new warehouse and boundary wall, we formed another employee subsidiary, a security guard company. They were trained, armed, and beca became quite effective. And that's another long story, so you'll have to ask me uh, afterwards. Okay, the union vote that was already scheduled. Through all the efforts I've described so far, the consistent message I had given at every employee meeting, company event, team gathering, was that they needed to give me a chance to set things right. Six months was not enough, so I actually encouraged the vote, telling them it was a vote on whether to give me a chance to provide fair and honest leadership or not. I only had six months to gain trust and respect, while ensuring the operational performance of the plants improved along with all the other duties of an IPP head. At one point I even said, if I fail you, we will have another vote in a year to join the union, and I'll support it. Stuck my neck out. The key breakthrough was with the former union officer who was a mid-level accountant. I told you to try to identify the ringleaders or the influence makers in an organization. I identified a lot of them, but I never really found the core guy until maybe five months into the process. Uh, this guy that I finally identified was uh, an accountant, mid-level accountant. So out of all the people I had tried to win over, he remained quite elusive. 